fellow citizens charged with the responsibility in doing what we may to advance the interests and promote the general welfare of a people lately enslaved and who, though now free, still suffer many of the disadvantages and evils derived from their former condition, not the least among which is a low and unjust estimate entertained of their abilities and possibilities and their value as citizens of the Republic. Allowing the existence of a magnanimous disposition on your part to listen candidly to an honest appeal for fair play coming from any class of your fellow citizens who may have or may think they have rights to assert or wrongs to address. The members of this national convention chosen from all parts of the United States representing the thoughts, feelings, and purpose of colored men generally would most respectfully and earnestly ask your attention and favorable consideration to the matters contained in the present paper. Born on American soil in common with yourselves, deriving our bodies and our minds from its dust, centuries having passed since our ancestors were torn from the shores of Africa. We, like yourselves, hold ourselves to be in every sense Americans and that we may therefore venture to speak to you in a tone not lower than that which becomes earnest men and American citizens. Having watered your soil with our tears, enriched it with our blood, performed its roughest labor in time of peace, defended it against enemies in time of war, and at all times been loyal and true to its best interest. We deem it no arrogance or presumption to manifest now a common concern with you for its welfare, prosperity, honor, and glory. If the claim thus set up by us be admitted as we think it ought to be, it may be asked what propriety or necessity can there be for the convention of which we are members? And why are we now addressing you, asking for justice and fair play? These questions are not new to us. From the day the call for this convention went forth, this seeming incongruity and contradiction has been brought to our attention from one quarter to another, sometimes with argument, sometimes without argument, sometimes with seeming pity for our ignorance, and at other times fierce censure for our depravity. These questions have met us with apparent surprise, astonishment, and impatience. We have been asked, what more can the colored people of this country want than they have now? And what more is possible for them it is said that they were once slave, they are now free. They were once subjects, they are now sovereign. They were once outside of all American institution. They are now inside of all and are a recognized part of the whole American people. Why then do they hold colored national conventions and thus insist upon keeping up the color line between themselves and their white fellow countrymen? Happily for us and for the honor of the Republic, the United States Constitution is just, liberal, and friendly. The amendments to this instrument adopted in the trying times of reconstruction of the southern states are a credit to the courage and statesmanship of the leading men of that crisis. These amendments established freedom and abolished all unfair and invidious discrimination against citizens on account of race and color, so far as law can do so. In their view, citizens are neither black nor white and all are equal. With this admission and this merit of reproof to trimmers and traitors, we come again to the question, why are we here in this national convention? To this we answer, 
First, because there is power in numbers and in union. Because the many are more than the few. Because the voice of a whole people oppressed by a common injustice is far more likely to command attention and exert influence on the public mind than the voice of single individuals and isolated organizations. Because coming together from all parts of the country, the members of the National Convention have the means of a more comprehensive knowledge of the general situation and may, therefore, fairly be presumed to conceive more clearly and express more fully and wisely the policy it may be necessary for them to pursue in the premises because conventions of the people are in themselves harmless. And when made the means of setting forth grievances, whether real or fancied, they are the safety valves of the Republic, a wise and safe substitute for violence dynamite and all sorts of revolutionary actions against the peace and good order of society. If they are held without sufficient reason, that fact will be made manifest in their proceedings and the people will only smile at their weakness and pass on to their usual business without troubling themselves about the empty noise they are able to make. But if held with good cause, by wise, sober, and earnest man, that fact will be made apparent and the result will be salutary. That good old maxim, which has come down to us from revolutionary times, that error may be safely tolerated while truth is left free to combat it, applies here. A bad law is all the sooner repealed by being executed, and error is sooner dispelled by exposure than by silence. So much we have deemed it fit to say of conventions generally, because our resort to this measure has been treated by many as if there was something radically wrong in the very idea of a convention. It has been treated as if some ghastly secret conclave sitting in darkness to devise strife and mischief. The fact is, the only serious feature in the argument against us is the one which respects color. We are asked not only why hold a convention, but with emphasis, why hold a colored convention? Why keep up this odious distinction between citizens of a common country and thus give countenance to the color line? It is argued that if colored men hold conventions based on color, white men may hold white conventions based on color and thus keep open the chasm between one and the other class of citizens and keep alive a prejudice which we profess to deplore. We state the argument against us fairly and forcibly and will answer it candidly and we hope conclusively. By that answer, it will be seen that the force of the objection is after all more in sound than in substance. No reasonable man will ever object to white men holding conventions in their own interest when they are once in our condition and we in theirs, when they are the oppressees and we the oppressors. In point of fact, however, white men are already in convention against us in various ways and at many important points. The practical construction of American life is a convention against us. Human law may know no distinction among men in the respect of rights, but human practice may. Examples are painfully abundant. It is our lot in life to live among people whose laws, traditions, and prejudice have been against us for centuries. And from these, they are not yet free. To assume that they are free from these evils simply because they have changed their laws is to assume what is utterly unreasonable and contrary to facts. 
Large bodies move slow. Individuals may be converted on the instant and change their whole course of life. Nations never will. Time and events are required for the conversions of nations. Not even the character of a great political organization can be changed by a new platform. It will be the same old snake, though a new skin. Though we have war, reconstruction, abolition, as a nation, we still linger in the shadows and blight of an extinct institution. Though the colored man is no longer subject to be bought and sold, he is still surrounded by an adverse sentiment which fetters all his movements. In his downward course, he meets no resistance, but his course upward is resented and resisted at every step of his progress. If he comes in ignorance, he conforms to the popular belief of his character, and in that character, he is welcomed. But if he shall come as a scholar and a statesman, he is held as a contradiction to the national faith concerning his race. And his coming is resented as impudence. In the one case, he provokes contempt and derision. But in the other, he is a front to pride and provokes malice. In spite of all your religion and laws, he is a rejected man. He is rejected by trade unions of every trade and refuse work while he lives and burial when he dies. And yet he is asked to forget his color and forget that which everybody else remembers. Not even our churches whose members profess to follow the despised Nazarene whose home on earth was among the lowly and despised, have yet to conquer this feeling of colored madness. And what is true of our churches is also true of our course of law. Neither is free from this all-prevailing atmosphere of color hate. The one prescribes the deity as impartial, no respecter of persons, and the other, the goddess of justice, as blindfolded, with swords by her sides and scales in her hand, held evenly between high and low, rich and poor, white and black, but both are images of American imagination rather than American practices. This condition of things is too flagrant and notorious to require specification or proof. Thus, in all relations of life and death, we are met by the color line. We can ignore it if we would, and ought not if we could. It haunts us at midnight. It denies us justice in courts, excludes our children from schools, refuses our son the chance to learn trades, and compels us to pursue only such labors as will, as will bring the least reward. While we recognize the color line as a hurtful force, a mountain barrier to our progress, we do not despair. We are a hopeful people. This convention is proof of our faith in reason, in truth, in justice, and our belief that prejudice, with all its malign accompaniments, may yet be removed by peaceful means. When this shall come, it will be then only used as it should be to distinguish one variety of human family from another. It will cease to have civil, political, or moral significance. And colored conventions will then be dispensed with as anachronism, wholly out of place, but not until then. Do not marvel that we are not discouraged when we consider how deep-seated this feeling is against us. The long centuries it has been forming, the forces of avarice which have been marshaled to sustain it, how the language and literature of the country has been pervaded with it, how the church, 
the press, the playhouse, and other influences of this country have been arrayed in its support. The progress towards its extinction must be considered vast and wonderful. If liberty with us is yet but a name, our citizenship is but a sham, and our suffrage thus far only a cruel mockery. We may yet congratulate ourselves upon the fact that laws and institutions of the country are sound, just, and liberal. There is hope for a people when the laws are righteous, whether for the moment they conform to the requirement or not. But until this nation shall make its practice accord with its constitution and its righteous laws, it will not do to reproach the colored people of this country with keeping up the color line. For that people would prove themselves scarcely worthy of, 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 of even theoretical freedom, let alone practical freedom, if they settled down in silence, servile and, and, and cowardly submission to these wrongs. They are bound to hold conventions in their own name and on their own behalf to keep up the grievances before the people and make every organized protest against the wrong inflicted upon them within their power. Who would be free themselves must strike the blow. We do not believe, as we are often told, that the Negro is the ugly child of the national family. And the more he is kept out of sight, the better it will be for him. You know that liberty given is never so precious as liberty sought for and fought for. The man outraged is the man who makes the outcry depend upon it. Men will not care for a people who do not care for themselves. Right. Go ahead and preach now. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Love gets it all.